Thank you, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition. I'm Father Mitch Packle, and this is a program where we take a look at the sacred scriptures through the lens of Catholic tradition. Now, in these programs we've been doing for the last uh, few months and for the months ahead, we're focusing on the Gospels so that we can use them in our prayer. How can we meditate more profoundly and find Christ in that? So that's going to be our goal as we uh, go through my books, Praying the Gospels. Now, of course, we'd love to have you become part of the show. You can do so like these nice folks from the great city of Chicago have done by coming here to be in the live audience. Or you can call during the live program, which is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you are going to call in North America, the phone number is 1-800-221-9460. 1-800-221-9460. If you are not in North America and can still call in, the number is country code 1, area code 205, 2712980. Also, you can send us your questions and comments via email by writing to scripture and tradition at ewtn.com. Or you can follow us and participate with the show on Facebook and YouTube. Now, today we are going to talk about the way that our Lord Jesus enlightened Simon Peter about his broader mission of evangelization beyond Capernaum and also his drawing of Simon Peter into this good news. And we want to try to understand how we might feel if we were in the same place as Simon Peter. So let's take a look at this. Again, we're getting close to finishing up. We'll finish up, I think, in the next week or so. Uh, my book, Praying the Gospels, Jesus Launches His Public Ministry. This, of course, is still available at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 52687, 52687. Now, this was written as an invitation to help people meditate on the very beginnings of this public ministry of Jesus. And we'll be finishing it up for in the next week or two, but then we'll continue with the same kind of book. The next series of shows will be from the second volume, Praying the Gospels, Jesus, Miracles in Galilee. You can also get that at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 52885. Okay, 52885. All right, let's now take a look at, uh, we, we were looking at how our Lord went to pray privately, and the disciples came looking for him. And we see that in uh, chapter 1 of Mark, verses 36 to 39, where it says, Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found Jesus, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. So this is the passage. And let's take a look at it. First of all, it's very important to note that Simon has no understanding of the importance of Jesus' prayer. He's looking for Jesus only so that he can bring them back to the big crowds. There's this multitude of people 
that want to see more miracles. They want to get healed. They want to have the demons cast out. And frankly, Simon is focused on the big crowds. And this is something that we have to be alert to. Um, you get an idea that Simon simply wants Jesus to stay at his home so people can keep um, uh, coming at, you know, to him and keep coming to him at, at his house. And he's kind of an important person in the neighborhood then, right? Everybody's showing up at my front door. And this is a temptation that a lot of preachers can have too, that you sometimes want to focus on yourself and the success that you have uh, praying for people to get healed and things like that. I saw that happen in some of the popular movements inside the Catholic Church, that sometimes people so focused on the great healings that were taking place or various uh, visions and such that they focused on those events rather than on preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation and forgiveness of sins and mercy. It's not that healing is bad. By, any, by no means is that bad. And we should pray for the faith to pray for people, but we have to be careful that we don't let even good things like the miraculous distract us from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what our Lord wants to do. Now, our Lord Jesus is not there to please Simon Peter. He's there to please his father. He's not there to do the will of the multitude. He's there to do the will of the Father. Very important for us to pay attention to. And his mission was to bring salvation to the whole world. And uh, this is very much the kind of thing that he has to keep in mind. Um, as a matter of fact, we read in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, where it says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, part of fulfilling the old covenant was that our Lord was sent to the people of Israel. Sometimes people say, well, why? Because he didn't want to go to the Gentiles. And he told the apostles not to go to the Gentiles, not because he doesn't like them, but because God had made a promise to Israel. So they receive the gospel first. And then our Lord will send the apostles out to the Gentiles. And this shows up as an issue a couple of times. At this point, our Lord simply wants to go beyond Capernaum and go to the other towns. He uh, wants to preach to them about the coming of the kingdom of God. And there are lots of towns in Galilee. And he wanted to go to them. And this is a very important point that this need for repentance and faith. Remember, that's what our Lord said. Repent and believe, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he wanted to go and preach that same message that he had been sent to give to the other towns of Israel. And so that's a very, very important thing. Now, as our Lord gets ready to go on his mission to the other towns surrounding the area, as a matter of fact, there were 
lots of towns around the Sea of Galilee because the Sea of Galilee had been become very famous, internationally famous for its pickled fish, that there were fish pickling factories all around the Sea of Galilee. So there are lots of towns to go to, right? And imagine yourself, try to picture yourself as Simon Peter. Imagine being in his shoes. And he has to go over and decide whether or not he really wants to tie Jesus down to Capernaum and hold on to Jesus. Hold on to what he already knows about Jesus instead of letting our Lord go on to the next stage. And think about how often that happens. When our Lord will later on talk about being crucified, it's Simon Peter who tries to get him to stop talking about them. You know, he rebukes Jesus for talking about the crucifixion. And he doesn't understand all the different stages of the ministry of Christ. And we have to ask ourselves, are we very different? Sometimes we have certain experiences of Christ and we want him to stay with what we already know. It's what we already know. That's what we like. I, I'm comfortable. And our Lord wants to take us beyond that comfort. He wants to take us to what the Father wants him to do and what the Father wants us to do. Doing the will of God is going to be key. So, you know, imagine yourself as being like Simon, going from door to door in the town of Capernaum. Capernaum was a few hundred people. Quite, quite a few hundred people. It's not a real tiny town. Nazareth was small. That was only about two, 250 people. But Capernaum was a bigger town. You know, and, and they're still doing excavation. They haven't excavated everything there yet. So imagine he's going looking from door to door. He's making a lot of wrong moves. What do you mean he's not with you? I thought he'd be with you or with you or with you. Picture that search for Jesus. And then eventually, after going through all the town, where the houses, by the way, are fairly close together. They didn't have big yards. They, in ancient cities, they would build their houses very close together and then go outside of town to farm. The idea of having a big yard in the city was not a good idea because you needed the city to be compact for defense purposes in case the city was attacked by other people. So picture this town uh, of these dark basalt stones and he's going door to door and then finally starts wandering around outside town and finally goes to what we now call the Mount of Beatitudes. That's where our Lord had gone. He wanted to get away from everybody and was in that little cave I mentioned last week. And after a number of hours of persistent looking, he, he didn't know that our Lord was in a cave praying privately. He finally cups, comes up on Jesus, comes to him and talks to him. And what I'd like you to do is think about what you might be thinking if you were Simon Peter at this point. As you go through this, what would your thoughts be um, about greater success locally? Again, there are a lot of Christians who think that way still. You know, I want to get a big mega church and I want to have be real famous and all. That's not what we're here for. We're not here to become famous. We're here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then as you, you have to 
keep looking around. And here's something that you have to then make a decision. And this is what Simon Peter had to do, just like all of us do. Make a decision about following Jesus into what is unknown. He was already aware of, oh, it's really kind of cool following Jesus with exorcisms and healings. I can see that. I like it. I know that. That I'm comfortable. But here we see he's willing to... Is he going to be willing to follow Jesus into the unknown? And this is something that applies to people all across the board. Think about that. When you get married, do you have a perfectly clear idea of how your family life is going to go? When you got married, did you know exactly what kind of kids you were going to have? What kind of house? A lot of you are not born in the United States, right? Did you know when you got married that you were going to live here or in the Philippines or some other place? I, how many? Do you, do you know what city? There's so many unknowns. Marriage is filled with unknown. I think this is one of the reasons why today the majority of adults are not even getting married. I know we, you know, people say, well, we got a crisis because you have a, no vocations to the priesthood. We have a crisis because there are not enough vocations to marriage where people are living together without the holy sacrament of matrimony. And it's because they're afraid of failure. A lot of them are afraid to fail, so I won't even fully try. I'll hold back. I'll keep some of my cards close to my chest. And I won't even try. That's not wise. You don't know what it's, what it's going to be like. That's part of the adventure of following Christ and following God's grace. And we have to ask ourselves, how much trust am I willing to place in Jesus Christ? Am I willing to trust him that marriage and following Holy matrimony, not shacking up, but holy matrimony. To, am I going to take that risk? And yet alone, vocation to the priesthood or religious life. You don't know what it's going to be like. But are you willing to trust Jesus to keep following that vocation? And it would be good to talk to our Lord. Picture yourself standing there with him in that cave, talking to him about your willingness to follow him, your willingness to go where he would take you, and that you are willing to trust his leadership in your life. This is a very important question. When you find you're asking our Lord that question, what kind of reaction do you have inside? What does this stir within you? And again, talk to our Lord like a friend to a friend. He's not trying to trick you. Our Lord isn't trying to make you fail. He wants your success. But he, even more than your success... Our Lord wants you to be faithful. Success is fine. But even if it doesn't look like success, he wants you to be faithful to him, and to his father. And after you meditate on this and talk to him about it, conclude with the prayer, soul of Christ, which says, soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Let me never be separated from thee. 
from the wicked foe defend me, and at the hour of my death call me and bid me come to thee, so that with your angels and saints I may praise you for all eternity. This is a wonderful prayer to speak to our Lord as you trust him, to follow him. All right, we're going to take a little break, and then we'll come back and take a look at one of the occasions of our Lord preaching to the crowds and Simon Peter's role in that. So please stay with us. First of all, I just want to mention um, before we start this reflection, we need to offer up prayers of thanksgiving for overturning Roe versus Wade last Friday. It was the feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which was, of course, on that Friday, always on a Friday, but it normally would be the birth of John the Baptist who was filled with the Holy Spirit in his womb, his mother's womb. He was jumping up and down. We show that he's fully alive and open to the Holy Spirit. And it was also the birthday for Nellie Gray. Now, a lot of folks might not know her, but Nellie Gray was the founder of the March for Life in Washington, D.C., which, and it's also the birthday of Justice Clarence Thomas. It was his birthday as well. So, and he, he had gone to Mass before it all came out. And, you know, you see what, this was a great risk for them. And they already knew that there were people trying to assassinate the ju justices that voted you know, for they figured out um, who would have voted for it. And this was, uh, you know, a very risky thing, but they took that risk because it wasn't in the Constitution. A lot of people are going to try to make this about supporting the Republican Party versus Democrats. They're going to try to make it about... Uh, imposing Catholic views on the world. You already hear on a lot of the uh, other networks, anti-Catholicism is on the rise by the people on the left. We used to get it from the Ku Klux Klan. Now we get it from the pro-abortion crowd. And they're trying to make it about imposing Catholicism. That's not what it is. It's not about Republicans or Democrats. It's about the Constitution. The Constitution does not have a right to abortion within it. It's not there. You, I hope you read the Bill of Rights. I urge you to read the Bill of Rights often so that you can understand that these are justices who are not trying to make decisions on the basis of what they think is society's norms. They make their decisions on the basis of the Constitution. And then the states, and that's what's happened here, the states will take this up. And what's very important for us to remember if we are going to be a pro-life people, this battle is not for life and for a culture of life as opposed to a culture of death. This is something that must go on for years to come. You know, 
just to think back, after Brown versus School Board, a decision back in 1954, overturned institutionalized segre racial segregation. See, that was the law because of another Supreme Court decision in the 1890s, I think 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, right around there. And they, that decision, the Supreme Court allowed racial segregation. And they undid that evil law. That was an evil law to have racial segregation. And they undid it on the basis of the Constitution. And it was another 15 years of reaction. The Ku Klux Klan and many people in the same party that are opposing Roe v. Wade, or are in favor, that are in favor of Roe v. Wade, the ones that want abortion were the same party that wanted to have segregation. Look back on your history. And there was a lot of violence that took place for 15 years, riots and all kinds of things. So it's very important for us to keep in mind that we need to, you know, try to do the same kind of work that Martin Luther King Jr. and many others did to overcome segregation, okay? All right, I want to take a look at chapter 8 in my book. This is when Jesus teaches a crowd from Simon Peter's boat. In Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, which is Sea, uh, sea of Galilee, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and they were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. But he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. Now this is a very important episode for Simon, Peter, and his partners. They're still fishing. And Gennesaret is also called Sea of Tiberias in the Gospel of John and the Sea of Galilee. It's, it had different names. Uh, but uh, just like the uh, Dead Sea is also called the Salt Sea and things like that. And uh, this is, uh, Gennesaret means the valley uh, that is enclosed because it's so low. It's such a low valley. It's, sea of Galilee is about 500 feet plus below sea level. And Jesus is doing this ministry and he's standing on the lake shore. People are pushing against him. Now the seashore provides a natural amphitheater. People, you, know, you can still see the place where people were sitting along what looks like an amph a natural amphitheater. And if, by getting into the boat, you can see a photograph of it on the screen. And people would sit around that little area and Jesus could preach. And if he got into the boat, the um, voice will be projected across the water. So that water helps carry sound, right? And so that's one of the great things that he had said. And he is preaching to the people. This is why he said back in Mark 1, 38, this is why I came to preach the gospel. So that's what he's doing. He's continuing on this mission. Uh, as, as he said in Mark 1, 38, let's go on to the neighboring town so I may proclaim the message there also. This is what I came to do. Now, think about some of the ways various celebrities try to keep themselves in the public eye. They have galas, public appearances. They always need to keep their names in the celebrity magazine. So I still don't understand why people read People magazine. I don't get it. Does, doesn't, I would like to have some of the people in People magazine, the, the people they're writing about, 
I'd like to meet some of them in my confessional from based on what they write in the headlines. But that's another issue. <laughs> but this is something that um, we see our Lord has no interest in being a celebrity. That's not what he's doing. That's not why he, he does this. And this is something that we should consider. I've, I've met lots of people who want to be in television in order to become famous and have people like them. That's dumb. That's dumb. And you know, I've been in television now for 38 years. And it's, you know, people will like you if you like people. You know, and my friends are not the folks that I'm wa they're watching because I don't really know most of them. I'd like to get to know some, they're very nice. But you know, that's not why you, you get in television or write music or make art. I asked one guy, he was, said he was uh, an art student. I said, why are you an art student? I said, well, I want to express myself. I said, don't. Don't express yourself. Seek what is beautiful and help create beauty in our world. If you express yourself, it'll end up as ugly as the art over in Chicago's uh, famous <laughs> art museum. You go to the modern art section, not all of it, but a lot of it is just flat out ugly. I can't wait to get out of that room and go to the medieval room or the Renaissance room where there's a lot of beauty. It's just beautiful. And I've had that experience in a number of art modern uh, museums. They're expressing themselves, but they make something not very pretty. So what we want to do is not try to have fame or self-expression. We don't want to put our needs out into the public. Our goal in here at the network, this is one of the things Mother Angelica was so clear on from the founding of this network. Our goal is to talk about Jesus. It's not to become famous. It's to preach Jesus Christ and let people know the truth of the church. And we have to make a decision. That's what we want to pray about with this passage. Do we really want what the world considers notoriety? Or do we want Jesus' version of service to God first and to our neighbor? Do you want to serve God and our neighbor or ourselves. And talk to him about that. Ask him, what would he think? And then conclude again with the prayer, soul of Christ. Use that soul of Christ prayer to conclude this and make that your, your prayer, okay? All right, well, we'll take up the next uh, couple of meditations next week, taking a look at Peter's uh, going out into the deep and getting a good catch of fish. We'll do that next week. We'd like to deal with questions first. So we have a lady here in our studio audience. This has been one of the nice things that we have folks right here in our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I was told to yeah, yeah. To do it again? Yeah, yeah, well, do, well ask your question, yeah. Okay, I just would like to find out any information, mm -hmm. suggestions, advice, or input about our younger generations who had grown up and raised by deeply religious, faith-filled Catholics, mm -hmm. and children sent to school, like all private schools, mm -hmm. Catholic schools, right. and they became good ministers, like altar servers, mm -hmm. lectors, whatever they are. And they are easily proselytized, and they even proselytize their parents. Yep. Okay. Couple things. 
this, uh, what you're asking about is not only a Catholic problem, it's a problem that occurs in lots of churches because it's not only being proselytized to join other Christian churches. Right now, and even uh, I think sometimes even bigger issue is um, people are being proselytized to become atheists. And when they go to college, their teachers push them to become atheists. Now, there are a couple things. One, in our catechism, we don't spend enough time teaching what the Catholic faith entails and why. They know how to prepare for the sacraments. They can do an examination of conscience before they go to confession. They know some things about the Blessed Sacrament, but there have been so, for the last 50 years, and it's getting better, by the way, it is getting better, but 50, 60 years ago, in the late 1960s, we were not teaching the Catholic faith. We were giving something that was nice, and we didn't want to talk about apologetics. Apologetics is the study of how you give the reasons for your faith. We didn't teach that. There was a naivete among many of the religion teachers who said, well, you know, it's a different age. It's an ecumenical age and all that. It's not. And right now, the bigger problem, I think, is with the atheists trying to get at our folks. And we don't know how to give our young people reasons to believe. That's what St. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always be ready to explain the apologia, the reasons for your hope in Christ. This is key. Secondly, we have to make sure that we are giving good example. We've gone through a period. I think it's kind of gone right now. That's, we've come over the hump on it. But we had bad example from a lot of clergy. A lot of priests gave horrible example with scandals. And that hurt a lot. People didn't trust that it was true enough. All of us have to give a better example and always be ready with answers. A lot of us are Catholics who n recognize Catholicism when we see it, but we don't know how to put it into words. And we have to, and so when somebody proselytizes our young people, they don't know how to explain their faith. Well, I'm just Catholic. My parents were Catholic. That's as much as they can say. That's not enough. They have to know the reasons for the faith. And then the other thing is, as parents and teachers, we have to pray for them to have the grace of faith. We need to depend on the graces of God, and that's key. Okay? Those are some things. I have to take a break. We'll be back. We have callers and uh, more questions from our studio audience, so please stay with us. Right, we have a caller on the line. Roger, you're calling from Cary, Illinois, right? Roger, are you there? Hello? I don't see him. I don't hear him. All Hello? right, well, let's, 
Let's try a f question from our studio audience. Ma'am, what was your question? So, um, my question is that, is this the thing that's happening around the United States, killing, sh shooting, is that because it started when the Ten Commandments were taken away from the court? Mm -hmm. So it's looked like for me is that because the, the people don't know anymore what are the Ten Commandments? No, they don't. They don't. When, when I taught at Loyola University in Chicago, my, uh, I would have my student, I would tell them ahead of time, on uh, one of the questions will be for you to write out all Ten Commandments. It was awful. The, the, the poor quality of knowledge of the commandments. I might get two or so correct. Then I would make them do it again at the midterm exam, write them out. They might get another couple. And then I'd make them do it again on the final exam, doing what I could to try and get them to memorize the Ten Commandments. And sometimes there were kids, uh, not kids, there were college students, who would say, wow, I didn't realize that was a sin. Do you have time for a confession? You know, that, but that's the reality. That's the reality. And that doesn't even deal with the ramifications of the Ten Commandments. But the Supreme Court made it illegal to even display the Ten Commandments in the schools. You can't even show them. That was a 1982 decision. And prayer and scripture were taken out of the schools. And I noted back when I was working at Holy Family Parish in Chicago back in 69, that they had replaced the Bible in the classrooms with metal detectors at the door because there were so many knives being brought in. Now we have trouble with guns. And we, we need to have a principle for what's right and wrong. I, you cannot legally teach thou shalt not steal. It's against the law. It's thou shalt not murder. You can't say that. Now, they'll tell you you shouldn't murder, but that God guarantees that you shall not. You'll be judged by God for murder, for stealing, for adultery, for false witness, coveting, yet alone having other gods and taking God's name in vain. So it's no surprise that we have a coarseness of language. Okay? That we, God, you can't teach. And we hear our Lord's name taken in vain in the media today. And this is it's not acceptable. But well, now we have, another, we have a caller. Roger, are you there? Yes, I am. There you go. Okay, so what you got for us? Well, I was uh, calling in regard to the Supreme Court uh, decision yesterday regarding the coach uh, praying at the 50-yard line on the football field. Mm -hmm. uh, the premise of the uh, court case was that he was not coercing anyone else to come and pray right. with them. Right. They did it on their own. I'm wondering that since he did that on his own, was he, I want to, I, word violation is not right, but of Matthew 6, 515, mm -hmm where it says, do not be like the hypocrites standing in the synagogues and out on the streets, but rather go into your room and close the door and mm -hmm. pray to your father who is unseen. Right. And that was, is he wrong for praying out there on the 50 yard line in Roger, front of all those people? Yeah, Roger, think about this. Notice how in Matthew 19, same gospel, right? Right. Our Lord says, whenever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. So here we have that we're supposed to pray together and pray in our room. Now, was the coach doing this as a way to say, hey, I'm uh, one of the greatest Christian coaches in the state of Washington. And I'm, I'm here praying. I hope you all notice. If that was his motive, 
then he would be going against our Lord's teaching in Matthew 6, where he's praying in order to get recognized by everybody else. On the other hand, if he is praying in thanksgiving that people didn't get hurt, <coughs> then and he instead he's giving a witness and other uh, his, his uh, team members come and pray too in thanksgiving for the way the game wins, especially not being hurt and things like that, then it's not that he is doing something in order to be seen. He's letting himself be seen so as to be a witness to call more people to pray together. And he didn't say to pray together, but he was just an, he, he was an attractant of faith. And again, when two or three are gathered in my midst, uh, when two or three pray in my name, I am there in their midst. And so he's praying in order for our Lord to be present to those young people that were on his team. So I think that's the difference. Does that help? I think he's gone. All right. We have another caller. Hello, Tommy. Hi, Father. Yeah, you calling from Chicago? Yes, Father. Thank you for taking my call, Father Pacwa. Sure. Um, my, my question is this, Father. I attended Catholic grade school and high school, mm -hmm. and I was, I was brought up with the teaching uh, that limbo does exist, that limbo is a place for mm -hmm. infants and very young children who die without mm -hmm. baptism, where mm -hmm. they go to limbo, they, they are happy, they see angels, they see saints, they see Our Lady, but they don't see the beatific, they don't see the face of God. Okay. So my question is this, I've come across some priests who, who've told me that uh, the church has done away with the concept of limbo. So, so I'm in between. Does limbo exist or is mm -hmm. it considered too cruel uh, for God to send uh, infants to where they will never see his face? They will never be with them, right. uh, other the other faithful. Uh, so I, I'm mixed up, Father. Okay. Tommy, let me explain something. And um, I had the Franciscan sisters of Our Lady of Lourdes that were our teachers. And they made it clear to us back in the 1950s when I was in grammar school that limbo was a theory. It is not part of divine revelation. It was a theological opinion. That's what it's technically it's called. It was a theological opinion because, and it was developed for this reason. One, these children who die unbaptized for whatever reason did not do any positive sin. They didn't commit any sin. But on the other hand, they're still born with original sin and they, they can't be in heaven without Christ within them, and yet they don't deserve hell because they didn't do anything positively wrong. So that was an opinion of some of the early theologians, that there's this other place called limbo. But it was always an opinion. Now, the church did not get rid of limbo. Pope uh, Benedict, I believe it was, had said that this is just what it is. It's a theological opinion and we don't have to hold it. We don't, it might be better for us instead of proposing this theological opinion, it may be better for us to simply deal with two things. One, the mercy of God is going to be greater than what we understand, and secondly, that we don't fully know how our Lord might redeem the, the, those who are not baptized. Now, one thing that, again, this is a theological opinion by Father Mitch Pacwa, and nothing more than that, okay? Just Pacwa's opinion. But I often have thought 
about the hundreds of millions of children who have been aborted, that their souls are like the souls of the holy innocents. They didn't know that they were dying for Christ. They didn't realize that they were martyrs. But today we celebrate them as martyrs, right? We have a feast of the holy innocents right after Christmas to celebrate that they gave their lives for Christ. And while they didn't necessarily give their lives for Christ in an explicit way, one thing I sort of suspect is that a lot of times they are martyrs because they die out of their parents' fear of having a child. Sometimes it's because the mother wants a career and they suffer for that. Sometimes they have, uh, you know, a, a very common cause of abortion has been a parent wants a boy and they get a girl so they abort it, or they want a girl and they get a boy so they abort the child. You know, they're martyred to the self, to the egos of the parents. And so they may not be martyrs for Christ explicitly, but they are martyrs for that kind of ego. Okay. All right. So that, but again, that's just my opinion. Um, and then when it comes, uh, I have an email here. Uh, Dear Father, Mitch Pacwa, regarding Jesus' private prayer, was it contemplative or meditative? He also interceded for himself in his public ministry and for others. Even as God, he prayed. Please comment on this. Yeah, his prayer would have been direct contemplation of his Father. You know, he, you know, I, you know, especially as a Jesuit, I'm trained in meditation. That's what we're trying to do in these these programs: is teach a little bit about uh, meditation on the Gospels. But our Lord would have direct contemplation of the Father who sent Him, and that would be it. Now He uh, intercedes, but notice what He says when He intercedes, um, Father. I make this prayer not for my sake, but for theirs, that they may know that you sent me. He sometimes would pray out loud so that the crowd would know that the Father, he's asking the Father, and the Father is answering him directly. And that way they know that. Okay? So that's that's what's going on there. All right. Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring you this program and all of our programs only because the network is brought to you by you. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you all for the generosity you've already shown us, and we hope to keep on proclaiming Jesus and his love. Thank you.